All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We're going to continue in our study on church history. Um, just the background for those um, who've maybe not been here for our previous ones. What we're doing is we're studying the 2,000 years of Christian history, but we're doing it topically. We're doing it topically. And we're going to do classes in pairs. The first class on a topic, we're going to look at the biblical example, right? That's what we care about, the biblical pattern. So for the first topic, we looked at creeds, and we looked at what is the biblical pattern of creeds. And then in the second class, the following class that corresponds to it, we trace that same topic throughout history. So then we looked at the 2,000 years of creeds throughout history. If you were here last Wednesday, the topic that we looked at was church organization. So how is the church structured? And we studied the biblical pattern. That means the very first Christians with the apostles in the book of Acts, how did they structure and organize their church? And then the class tonight is going to be the complimentary lesson where we see how has organization changed over time? And then what are we doing right now as a local church body to go back and match the original pattern? Uh, two things to pray for. Uh, pray for the Hersey family. Um, babies right, right around the corner. So pray there. Um, and then let's still continue to pray um, for Alan Bagley. Nick, could you lead us in prayer, please? Sure. Thank you. Father God, you're a gracious and loving Father. You are merciful and loving towards your people. You teach us your ways and you guide us in the way that you want us to go. Lord, please help us as we study tonight to know more about your character and your organization of your church. Help us to have submissive and soft hearts that we might submit ourselves to your plan and not do what we want to do, but do what you want to do. Help us to be focused on your things, heavenly things, and not our things or worldly things. But help us to do things your way. Lord, please be with all those who are struggling right now or on the verge of major change in their life. Please be with the Hersey's as they welcome the birth of baby Edgar, that they might have a healthy baby that we might love and teach them to know you. Please be with Alan and for his struggles and help him to come through this time, Lord, and be with all the friends and family around him that we might love them and support them during this time. Please be with Ryan and help him to recall to memory the things that he's prepared and help him to present it in a way that we might know it and apply it to our lives. In the name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sir. All right, so just a recap of what we're doing. The purpose of this class, why are we spending 13 weeks on church history? It is not for us to go around the religious world and point the finger. It is for us to be redirected in our approach back towards the Bible. So we're going to look at some models today throughout the 2,000 years of history, and a lot of it is wacky, a lot of it is weird, and we can talk about that, and we can discuss air. But just a reminder, whenever we're doing these history lessons, that the air is to be a warning to us. It's not for us to say, oh, they were so foolish. Why didn't they read the book of Acts? It is for us to say, I see why they did that. They were pushed because of this reason. We need to be cautious whenever that might come into our congregation. So that is our, our goal for tonight. Just saying that as, as a reminder, but I really have appreciated the comments. And of course, as always, comments are welcome. I want us to have a good conversation tonight. Who's in charge here? This is the conversation that we did at the very beginning and the very end of last lesson. Someone new walks in, or maybe you go to a new congregation when you're traveling or visiting, and someone asks the question, who's in charge here? We should have an answer for that. We should be able to say consistently with our other brothers and sisters that we know who is in charge here. And this is the pattern that we spent all last class on. We spent 45 minutes studying who these people are, what those words meant, what their roles were, what their responsibilities were. That is the model, that is the pattern. So you have your eldership at the top, those are the individuals who lead. They're always mentioned in a plurality. There's not just one of them. They are a group that work together. And then we have two Greek words that are used to describe those men. The first one just describes someone who is older, right? That's where we get the word elder. And then we also see this word as 
overseer, or we might today use the word manager, someone who manages or oversees. Below that tier are the deacons. This is where we say they're called servants. Why are they called servants? Because they serve. The servants do the serving. And so that is another organizational feature that God has put into his church. That's not a tradition of man. That is how God has structured the church. And then we have the saints. We're all believers here. That would be us here in the body. And it's from the word um, that means holy, to set apart. So who are we? We are the holy ones. We are the ones set apart. The word saint is not talking about some elitist class of individuals who reached a certain level of mature Christianity. That's not the biblical use of the word. Biblical use of the word is those who are called out of the world into the saving body of Christ. We are all saints. Let's go ahead and push forward into what we're talking about tonight. And here's our history. We're going to start early. Start early. Um, I have a, a little bit of a special privilege tonight because I'm also teaching the invitation, which is kind of fun. And my invitation tonight is going to be out of this book. Um, the Didache is one of the earliest Christian writings that we have that is, you know, extra biblical. So it's not in the Bible. It should not be in the Bible. It's not inspired word of God. But it is early, early Christian writers discussing the organization of the church. And I love going to this because it backs up this idea that there are bishops and there are deacons. Those are our words. Instead of elder, we can say bishop. That's a perfectly appropriate translation. And we have deacons. Keep reading down to the quote. I mean, look how early we are. We still have prophets. So we're talking early. We're talking like some people think that the apostle John might still be alive. Very, very early writing. The earliest writings back up this structure right here. So cool. We're off to a good start. Even outside of the book of Acts, we have a structure that follows eldership, deacons, and then saints. Very quickly, though, we see that change, and we see that pivot. I'm going to ask you guys to recall some of the earlier classes we had about heresy. Heresy in the early church Remember, that's that word that means beliefs that are not orthodoxy. So beliefs that are contrary to the Bible. That was a massive, major problem in the early church. What do we do about heresy? They called all these councils together. They got all the bishops together, and they started writing out these creeds. One of the main drivers was a man by the name of Ignatius. Ignatius is going to have some very different views about what these roles are. So Ignatius writes these different letters, and here we see him addressing a local body, and we're still early. They think this letter was written between you know, 98 to 117. That's really early. And here's what Ignatius says. In like manner, tell all men to respect the deacons as Jesus Christ, even as they should respect the bishop as being a type of the Father. So we're using metaphorical language here. We need to honor the deacons as if they're Christ and honor the bishop as if the bishop is Father. So relationship between Father-Son, same relationship between bishop-deacon. And the presbyters, that's our word for elder, as the council of God and as the college of apostles, Apart from these, there is not even the name of a church. And so we see here that these original words, one who is old and overseer, we said in the Bible, that's the same person. That's an elder. That's what they are. But Ignatius is saying they are two different groups of people. That's different now. So here we have changes in leadership. The one who is old, cool, so we're going to keep the plurality of elders. That's cool. We're, we're all right with that. But now we're going to have this word overseer, not to mean you oversee the congregation, but in fact you oversee the eldership. That's a change. That's a change that we need to see. Sometimes it's referred to as a super elder, a super elder, or I, I think of it as the manager of managers. The managers of managers. 
So this is now Ignatius's structure of the church. We got four parts now. We got four parts. We still have the saints and the deacons. We're good with that. We have elders, right? One who is old. But now we have a bishop. We have even a higher level of authority, which did not match our biblical pattern previously. I'm going to pause here for comments or questions. If there are none, I'm totally fine with that. But what do we think caused this? I'll pose that question to you all. Why the transition? Right? We know in church history, nothing just happens. Oh, I have a great idea. It's usually because of a reason. Why do we think we're, we're centralizing power like this? Go ahead. Yeah, definitely. And I love the Old Testament example, right, of Israel. Israel got a pattern from God of how they were to structure and organize themselves. But that didn't look like what all the other nations were doing, what all the other countries were doing. So maybe the early church is kind of doing that, where the early church is looking around the Roman world, and they're saying, yeah, I know that we have this pattern example from God, but maybe we should structure it more like how Rome looks. Yeah, that's a great point. Any other possibilities? Why do you think we're changing here? I'm a little more cynical as what he said. The group wanted to have one guy. I think a lot of it had to do with one guy wanted to have the group. Yeah. <laughs> one guy wanted to be, they wanted one guy in charge, or one guy wanted the power mm-hmm. to be in charge. It, I mean, if we think about the conversation between elders where there might be friction, that's good. Where one elder brings another man to the scripture where he may not have thought about it, and vice versa, that man brings the other elder to the scripture in a way that he may not have thought about it with one guy in charge. I don't have to do that. What I found or what was revealed to me, we're going to go with that. Can I see a hand over here? Jay? Whether you want it for yourself or you're pushing somebody into a position to possibly push your own agenda, I mm-hmm. think there, there could be various reasons. So not only do I, I love that comment of, well, you know, we have examples of people attaching themselves as being disciples of one, but there's a church history writer from the 400s who makes that exact same case and quotes the I'm from Apollos, I'm of Paul. I'm looking at the Wikipedia article mm-hmm. for bishops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. what you said, and then it talks about the evolution of the process, and this is what I noticed. Eventually, as Christendom grew, um, metropolitan bishops in large cities appointed people, and then later it says, as the church continued to expand, and so it seems like this is, I do, I'm not really sure seems like it's a response to massive growth. Yeah. And mm-hmm. probably it was a scary thing to say, if we don't, you, you can't just let that congregation over there be independent. What if they go wild? Exactly. Well, I mean, that's the heresy argument too. How do we know that people are going to be doctrinally sound? We're going from maybe a group of 25 to 50 people meeting in the courtyard of a house, and that's church, to now we have an established Roman religion in the 300s-ish where we have mandated Christianity. It is the official religion. So it's almost like having a mom and pop shop one day and then the next day you're an international business. Well, we're probably going to need to do some leadership changes, or at least that's the thought. I'm going to push forward real quick. And so this is, this is the question. 
Are we talking about two different roles here? Or is this still one role with two titles? And I'm going to revert back to this is still one role. It is still the eldership, but has the different titles. The reason why I think this makes sense just linguistically, right? We don't even need to dive into all the Greek. But if Paul called the elders overseers, but someone is overseeing them, then they're not the overseers. They're being overseen. Or use the same word with elder. It just means like uh, someone who's stately, wise, is older. It would be weird to say, well, yeah, you fit that qualification, but we need someone wiser and older and more complete in the faith. Well, then that just sounds like the qualification of an elder. And so if you use both of those, and, and don't get buried down in the Greek, we can understand what I bolded down there. You know, it was an interchangeable term for the vast majority of the early, earliest writings that we have. Jay, here's your point. So we got a guy named Jerome. I, I know the red is brutal. It's an awful highlighting color, but I wanted it red. I wanted it red tonight. Jer look how early Jerome is writing. So Jerome, he's an early church historian. So he's writing about the history of the church. This is his commentary on Paul's letter to Titus. Okay, that, that should ring some bells. Why does that fit into our conversation? Well, there are qualifications for elders in Titus. And so whenever he gets to that piece of text, look what Jerome says. I'm going to skip around a little bit. So he says, a presbyter, that's our word elder, is the same as a bishop, and beyond that, people began to say, so he's, he's a historian, he's reflecting on what happened in the early church, people used to say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. That's a comment that Jay made, right? They were being baptized, and instead of saying, oh, I belong to Christ, early Christians were saying, I belong to the person who baptized me, which, read the New Testament, that idea is shot down. We do not do that. We belong to Christ. The churches were governed by the common council of the elders. That's what we have here, right? We don't really use the word council, but we could. There's three of them. They sit together. They plan, make decisions. That's our council of elders. But after that, so after the dispute with the I am of this, I am of this, after that, each one was accustomed to regard those whom he had baptized as his own disciple and not of Christ. Okay, that's a problem. How are we going to solve the problem? It was decreed in the whole world that one chosen from among the elders should be placed over the others. Therefore, as elders may know, that the custom of the church, they are subject to the one who has been placed over them. So also bishops must understand that they are greater than the elders. So I think we see a lot of things going on. But now that we see what Jerome is talking about, can we maybe answer the question a little bit better? Why the change? Why the change? What was Jerome arguing? That we go from one person now to split into two different titles. What's he arguing here? Go ahead, Dave. Sounds like they need a tiebreaker. <laughs> it's it's very it, it's it's just like mankind to think this way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Why would we risk the gray area that God has put in place mm -hmm. when God did that on purpose? Yeah, definitely. And it's not like they're not scared. That's a big issue. Having people who are recently converted, people who are recently baptized say, oh, no, I'm, I'm not of Christ. I'm of Paul. Okay, that, that's a major doctrinal dispute. A few class periods ago, we would have called that heresy. It's not orthodoxy. And so we got to iron that out. It looks like it was decreed in the whole world that one chosen from among the elders should be placed over the others. I like what you said, tiebreaker. Someone who can be definitive. 
someone who can just get the job done, right? Smother this heresy. This is not good. We need to steer people in the right direction. This whole council of elders working together, we got an efficiency problem. So let's just have one guy up at the top. Here's what I thought, you know, maybe some possible changes. You might have another one. You might have worded it a little bit differently. Combat heresy, that's Jerome. Church following the structure of Roman government. That's a, no, a new one, right? That's, that's kind of interesting. That picture up there of the bishop, you know, holding the sign of blessing on the other person, that guy kind of half kneeling in the cool robe, that's Constantine. So that's, that's the first, I'll put this in air quotes for people listening online, air quotes, the first Christian emperor. And he's the guy who says, we're not going to be pagan anymore. Okay, get the Greek mythology out of here. No more Mars, Venus, Jupiter. We're not worshiping those people. We're going to worship the one God. But I'm going to be the chief administrator here. I'm still the emperor. Still the emperor of Rome. I'm going to show you guys a slide in, in just a second. The comparison between the breakdown of Roman society and the church post-Constantine. And it's just Roman government with new words. Mark, here's, here's maybe your point. The consolidation of power. There might be some bad motives here too. Stomping out heresy, that's a good motive. I can understand that. I don't love the result, but I can understand that. But maybe there are some bad motives. The point of this slide is not to bash and say, oh, look how goofy this is. I can't believe it. That's not the point of this slide. The point of this slide is to say, once you believe that there can be a ruler of the person who God said can rule, then why not just have a leader of a leader, of a leader, of a leader. And that's what it turns to. To what point do we then have an efficient structure? So the priest in this role, or in this row, that, that's your elders. We'll talk about how priest turns to elders in just a little bit. But then we're going to have bishops over them. Then archbishop, the word arch means chief, a little architecture nerd time. If you all see the back door right there, it has wood casing over it. In architecture, that's called the architrave. It's the chief beam. So the archbishop is over the door frame. But then, well, we got to have someone managing the archbishops. Someone's got to oversee them. Someone has to be an elder to them. So then we'll have the cardinals. And then it will just keep going up the ladder. This is not just a thing with our Catholic brothers, though. This is widespread throughout many of the different denominations, but it all stems with uh, the overseers need an overseer. Because you, you have to validate that they're better somehow. Because if it's an invented position, we've well, got to back up the invented position with some type of invented authority. And so there's got to be some way that they're better, more superior, more of an overseer over to me. Any other comments here? I've got a cool map of ancient Rome. Dave and then Nick. Mm -hmm. And then on the positive side, uh, where God's speaking to his people, saying his organization of leadership is more on heads of households, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting because it puts the familial uh, leadership uh, in the scope of what God's trying to organize, where it's heads of households as families. Mm -hmm. Either for a positive 
Mm -hmm. On the family point, and we, we need to go back to the qualifications of elders. Let's be cynical for a little bit. There's no way you know your sheep. There's no way when you are over hundreds and sometimes thousands of individuals, not only that you know your sheep, but that on judgment day, when you give an account for them, there, what checklist do you have to look over an entire archdiocese, an entire synod of people? Nick? To go off Becky's point real quick, ultimately there's an authority problem here because on the letter that he showed us that it was decreed over all of earth, you know, the custom of the church is going to be that we do this thing. And if you believe the church has the same authority as God and the same authority as the apostles, that's totally legitimate. Mm -hmm. But knowing that that's not where authority comes from, where authority comes from God, we can see how that is a man-made tradition and not something that is biblical like we read about mm -hmm. in the epistles. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Therefore, the elders may know that by the custom of the church. I thought we were studying biblical pattern. You know, I thought we were studying what was the biblical example. And now we're going into... Well, what were the customs of the church? Here's our map for you. Um, these are the provinces, the provinces of Rome. So we might, if you guys can see Jerusalem, all the way on the right, a little green era, area, that's Judea, right? We, we hear that in like the story of the nativity. These are all of the different organizational structures. You might want to call them states. Right, if, if Rome broke up into states, this is how we would do it. That automatically becomes the amount of archbishops that we have. Once Constantine comes into power, he's going to use the structure of Roman government to say, let's just pick one. Crete. You know, there, there's not just going to be multiple churches there. I'm going to put one guy over this whole province. Or what about Asia? We know a lot of the congregations in Asia, right? Ephesus, the seven churches in the beginning of the Revelation, and Asia, that's in purple right there. We're just going to have one archbishop over Asia, and they're going to report back to me. And we look at this, and I understand that you're going to be like, okay, well, I mean, how do we really know that? Like, is it really based off of the Roman government? Here's a little graphic that I found. The top one is the Roman government. And then the bottom one I created. And so this is the structure of Roman government. We don't need to go into the entire big structure about how Roman government worked. But they had three tiers. You had an assembly. Then you had higher up people that were the Senate. right? Those were the people making your rules. And then that very top class... Right? It says the monarchy. That's the monarchy branch. That's where the emperor is and all the people of his royal family, the people that he calls into his court. That immediately becomes the structure of the church. Your assembly is your laity, us here. Then you've got to have some people who are making the decisions. You have your bishops. And we would nod yes to that. Yes, our elders are making decisions that we as a whole are not doing. But then above that, we're going to have these councils. You guys remember doing Council of Nicaea? All these councils that are cranking out the different creed statements? Well, the emperor is going to sit in on those. And in fact, he's going to be the one that calls them into session. The emperor is going to be the one, whenever archbishop over there dies, I get to fill that position now. It's still a process that happens today all over the denominational world. I'm, I'm not just looking at one particular group of, of Christian tradition. Of all of these different groups, that's how it's done. We're not playing the game of the local congregation gets to choose their elders anymore. Now it's top down. Moving top down. 
Any comments here? Comparison between Rome and the church? Go ahead, Mark. That last thing you said was the biblical example that the church appoints their elders, or the church picks their elders, not a council picks them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, straight away from the, the biblical example. Yeah, we, we need to know our elders very, very closely in order to say, oh, I know Mark's household. I know that his children are faithful. Right? I mean, look at the qualification where it says, your elder must be in good standing with the community. Right? Other community members, non-Christians, have to have a good image, would say good things about that man's character. If I'm over in Rome, in the palace, I'm literally just going off of other people's suggestions. Hey, so-and-so died. He was the archbishop in this area. We got to fill his spot. Got anyone? I was just going to say, as you're talking, it makes me uh, think of just a political system. Like, it, it's no longer we, un- we really know this person. It's, what are they saying? Are they saying what we want to hear? And, oh, are they, you know, saying, um, doing the right things out in public? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, I keep thinking about you know the, the the structure of the Roman government that it was structured the way it was so that they could have rule of law, <laughs> they, they could have order, everybody could be on the same page, and there could be uh, a productive society. So I mean, as far as far as people are concerned, that's the way we organize in order to be productive. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so. If Mm-hmm. We're packed though, and we are having a hard time coming up with money to buy a new building. It would be really nice if Kirkwood and Hackman Road and mm-hmm. you know all these churches in the area were under a bishop so we could pool resources. Yep. You know, so I mean it, it's it would be very easy to see uh, wisdom in doing something this way. Mm-hmm. So I mean it does point to the the importance of biblical Yeah, definitely. And it's not like this is totally unappealing. I I wrote down some examples. To your point, um, we think about the megachurches, right? Some of the large megachurches under one, one pastor. And that might be efficient. You have, you know, a common theme. You got a common theme in the message. The agenda is always going to be financed. You know, there's some efficiency there. I think about in a lot of the American churches, we're so involved and comfortable with the corporate world, you look at a church model and it looks like a corporate structure. There are, there are churches that have HR departments. I don't need an HR department with my family. Or you see, you know, these individuals are only going to be the money elders. These individuals are only going to be the teaching elders. And then these elders, they're going to be over children's ministry. The monarch structure There are multiple countries still to this day where their monarch, their king or queen, is the head of their religious structure. Most notably, right, Queen Elizabeth, who just passed away in England. Now we have King Charles III, I think. He's not just King Charles III. He is the head of the Church of England. So he's the the super bishop. Do you have a point? Yep. Begs the question, how does the church handle the Mm Mm-hmm. And that's a conversation where it even gets more complicated when we start getting all this money. Next two classes, we're going to look at cooperation. You know, to what extent do we have a friendly relationship with other congregations? Do we pool money together? Can we share money to deal with things like growth? Sticky situation there, too. Okay, I'm, oh, go ahead. And I'm going to push on after Ryan. Mm-hmm. And I, I like, 
I like what I'm hearing here where it's like, let's try and understand. And also, let's try and assign. I think it's true. We can assign good motives. It's not like these people designing this stuff sat around with their little horns and said, how can we ruin the world? Yeah. Like they had good motives. Mm -hmm. But what you learn from this is probably at the top of their list was we're scared of the church slipping into heresy. Mm -hmm. And so let's do this and look at what happened. Yep. The church slipped into a giant heresy. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really meshes, I think, with my faith class. And just, we might not understand how God's way mm -hmm. works, but to just trust in what he said and to stick with that. There we go. Instead of saying, well, I have a better organizational model because it works great for my international business that I work for. I mean, we're doing good. We're a very efficient, productive manufacturing plant. That doesn't mean you're in the soul's business. And that doesn't mean that you wrote the blueprint. I'm going to skip past this new topic. If you want to talk to me about it, I love it. I love this topic. Where did the priesthood come from? Are we talking about elders or priests? Elders, not priests. For time, I'm skipping over that. Talk to me about it, though. Very interesting thing. How do we have a priesthood today? I thought priesthood was Old Testament. We'll talk about that in the foyer after if you want to. I, I want to do the, these two models. I'm picking these because they are using the word. Do you remember the word for elder? That's where we get Episcopal, the Episcopal church. That's the model. Congregation to a rector, which I, I'm assuming that would be the elder, but it's singular. We have one guy. And then that one guy reports to the bishop, to the archbishop. Okay, well, Presbyterian. Remember our word? Presbyter? That's where you get the word for Presbyterian. So, I mean, they're pulling the right words. They're pulling the right words, but their structure is not matching up. Same thing. Congregation to, uh, oh, I like this, a session of elders. Okay, plurality, cool. But then the elders report to an elder who report to a general assembly. What we could do is we could do 1,700 to 1,800 years of church history and look into all the denominational splits. I don't think we should do that. They all look like this. I want to jump forward to when do we start looking back? When do we start looking back to the original pattern? I'm not saying that this is the first guy to do it, but he's one of the most famous ones to do it. Let's talk a little bit about Barton Stone. I got like six, seven minutes left. Let's knock out what he thought. Barton Stone, Presbyterian minister, write that word. So presbyters, the elders together. He thought that this was a good church structure. Him, he is in charge of, you know, one congregation as a minister. Another minister is in charge of another congregation. And we're going to pool together and be a collection of little churches. That's exactly what we've been talking about. They break away, though, from this structure in Kentucky. Be like, no, we don't, we don't like your conglomeration of churches. We're going to form our own conglomeration of churches. So they're questioning the system. To cut this story really, really short, in 1804, they look at themselves. They call themselves the Springfield Presbytery. Springfield is the city that they lived in, Presbytery. All the little churches in Springfield... In 1804, they dissolved themselves. They said, we got to stop this. They did it in what I think is one of the most hilarious ways possible. They do it kind of satirically. They gathered everyone together for a mock funeral. And the script that they wrote was the eulogy for their church organization. The last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. This is what they write. So the organization was called the Springfield Presbytery, and they're writing this statement that says, this conglomeration that we were a part of, it's dead. It died. We're here to mourn it. Listen to what they said. We will that this body die, be dissolved, and sink into union with the body of Christ at large. Amen to that. For there is but one body and one spirit. 
We will that our name of distinction with this reverend title be forgotten. Right? Springfield Presbytery, where, where is that title in the Bible? Now we're getting rid of that title. That there be but one Lord over God's heritage and His name. We will that our power of making laws for the government of the church and executing them with the authority forever cease. So we're not getting together. We're not making laws for each other. I make a law that affects this church. You make a law that affects my church. We're each making rules for our own churches here. We will that the church of Christ resume her native right of internal government. Our overseers are going to oversee us. Not one overseer oversees the overseers, or that overseer oversees a different church's overseer, internal government. We will, this is getting to the satire part, they, they almost have a, a plea for mercy, because not everyone's on board with this, right? You have 1,800 years of church structure where it's been the hierarchy, there's going to be some people who are not on board with this. Here's what they say about those brethren. We will that our weak brethren, who may have been worshiping to make, or wishing to make the presbytery of Springfield their king, there's a king comment, and what not what is now become of it, betake themselves to the rock of ages and follow Jesus for the future. So you got some friends in your group who are like, no, we, we should keep the presbytery. We, we should keep it together. They said, take that to the Rock of Ages, my friend. Exactly. It needs to be that simple for all that we do in the Bible. Are, in our are you hearing this conversation, though, about it's a character reflection? We need to be looking at what we believe. Jake, this is how they opened up. They opened up mashing together Hebrews 9 and John 12 by saying, in order for a good and proper belief to be born, the bad belief must die. That's a hard conversation with yourself. That's a hard conversation when your entire religious upbringing, your entire religious perspective on the world has followed a certain structure, and they quote from Hebrews and from John and say, the death of the one who made it must be established. And then talking about the grain, when it falls into the earth and dies, but if it dies, it bears much, much fruit. That's their opening statement to this document. So I'll, I'll close with this. I, I think we're at time, and it looks like Alwyn's ringing the bell now. When we are looking at practices in our own life, and we see that something is not matching up with the biblical pattern that we have studied, 
it's a tough, tough decision to say that old perspective needs to die. But that's not the end of the story. And I don't, I don't want to get preachy here. That's not the end of the story because once the grain dies, it grows and it bears much fruit. So there is a happy ending here. We're not going through the 2,000 years of church history and smashing down all the old cathedrals and, and burning the robes and kicking over the thrones. We're not doing that for no reason because the biblical example bears fruit. And that's our motivation. So I'll end with the same question. Who's in charge here? We should be able to give a defense for that. I'll leave you guys with the last comment. Thank you, guys. We'll talk about money next class.